So on to our first speaker. I had the pleasure of meeting Matthew Griffin earlier this morning. He's an amazing character, highly intelligent. Um, he's an author, he's an entrepreneur, he's an international speaker. Um, he has advised governments, regulators, investors and multinationals on how they can tackle some of the challenges ahead and leverage technology to meet those challenges head on. So it's my absolute pleasure to greet Matthew Griffin onto the stage, our futurist. Enjoy. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good to see you. Likewise. Thank you. Hi, everyone. How are you? I don't suppose any of you, just any of you want to do my presentation for me, do you? Sherwell kept me up late last night, so yeah, if, if the presentation's a little bit groggy, uh, then yeah, blame them. So, uh, so as we know, basically the theme of the conference today basically is adapt or die. Now, yeah, as Patrick said, basically that's that's quite dramatic. How many of you have heard of that phrase, adapt or die? So, how many of you think it's actually a little bit too dramatic? No. So, because I think the conference should actually have been called this. Adapt or fade away slowly into oblivion and irrelevance by here and die with a whimper. <laughs> because companies don't just suddenly die. Yeah? They just vanish. So with today, basically what I'm going to be doing is uh, I'm going to be having a conversation with you about disruption, emerging technologies, and all these sorts of things. And uh, I work with a whole variety of different organizations. So Sopra Stereo basically is, is one of the, my visionary uh, partners basically that I work with. Um, and it's actually thanks to them that I'm here today. Uh, I sit on the board of Centrica. So I sit on Centrica's Technology and Innovation Committee. Um, essentially, what that means is we are creating next generation energy grids and autonomous energy grids, basically, for Europe. Uh, I work with a whole variety of different consumer organizations like Huawei and Samsung. So uh, I've helped design the next five generations of smartphones and things that come beyond. Uh, I also work with regulators like Ofcom. Uh, and Ofgem, I work with a whole variety of different governments around the world. So in Canada, we're building out innovation superclusters. In the UAE, basically, we are literally building the country of the future. And we'll sort of have a little bit of a chat about that. Um, everybody should be interested in the future. Because it's where you're all headed. But very few organizations actually spend time, in my experience, really examining it thoroughly. A lot of organizations today typically take a relatively narrow look at the future. And then they wonder why they get sideswiped. So I'm going to play you this short video now. And for the experts among you, watch the images. I wish I could see beyond what I can see I wish I could touch beyond what I can touch I wish I could feel beyond what isn't real I wish I could imagine imagine yeah there's more to who we
So one of the questions I have now is, if we're going to write that out of 10, write a pop song out of 10, 10 is you love it, zero is you hate it. How many of you would write that under five? Yeah, actually, you're in line basically with some of the UK MOD generals. It's a cynical bunch. How many of you would rate it six, seven, Eight, nine, ten. Okay, we've got ten. That's it. Congratulations. So, you guys basically have sort of rated that at about seven and a half. And actually, that's in line basically with a lot of the other countries around the world, basically from Dubai basically down to South Africa, all the way through to China. Now, did any of you watch the images like I asked you to do? Did you see anything special about the images? Because they were a hint. What you just watched was composed, compiled, and created by an artificial intelligence. That wasn't a pop singer. It was an artificial intelligence, a neural network basically called Ampner. On YouTube, it has over half a billion views. It has 452,000 YouTube followers, basically, at the last count. And Sony signed it last year, and it's now produced the world's first artificially intelligent album. If you speak to analysts, the analysts that your businesses speak to, to try to figure out the pace of change, the dynamics of change, technologies, etc., 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 that creative AI, they will tell you that that creative AI either should not exist or it will arrive in 2035. It arrived in 2017, and actually that video is now getting a little bit old. <laughs> so, yeah, the pace of change is faster than we think. Technology is all the way over there. Businesses are here. Regulators are all the way over there. Now, as has already been alluded to, tomorrow Sir Ranulph Fiennes basically is going to be uh, talking to you, out uh, of the lucky people that see him. Uh, and as one of the world's greatest, greatest explorers, he's got quite a lot in common with entrepreneurship. Exploration and entrepreneurship kind of go hand in hand. But you need to be prepared. Now, it's unlikely that when Sir Ranulph Fiennes, when he was 65, basically he was looking to scale Everest, it's very, very unlikely that he dressed like this. When you're scaling Everest, one of the things that you want to do is you want to be able to get to the top, you want to be able to summit, and you want to be able to get down as quickly as possible. You want to carry as little equipment as possible, you just want to get up and down. So, logically, you should probably wear speedos. But that's wrong for the environment that you're going into. Now, in 2009, one of my friends and I from Basingstoke set off on our own exploration. Uh, we decided that we wanted to, for whatever reason, uh, row the Atlantic Ocean. Now, what we did is we had a look at the environment that we were going into and the journey that we were going on. And we had to row about 3,500 miles, basically from Gomera to Antigua. And um, we looked at the environment, basically, and we thought, OK, the Atlantic is rough. There are 40-foot swells. Storms basically come in day in, day out. We need some form of vehicle. So what we did, basically, we had a look at all the vehicle choices out there. And uh, we thought that the best way to protect ourselves was with the tank. Gets you from A to B, doesn't it, safely? But it was actually, we, we figured tanks actually aren't that good, because when you put them into the sea, they sink. Um, 
So instead, basically, we opted for an Atlantic rowing boat. So, and that was actually, under the conditions, basically, that was actually the right choice. We then thought, well, we're going to be burning about 6,000 calories a day. We need food. Now, both of us, being from Basingstoke and kind of the country, basically, we like our organic food. And they always tell you, basically, that chicken basically, is one of the best things that you can eat. So what we thought, again, we thought, well, free-range organic chicken. If we have 120 of these, basically, then, you know, we can eat chicken every single day. It'd be really great. But again, even though that ticks the right box, food, it was actually wrong for what we were trying to do. Because it's very, very difficult to cram 120 chickens and all the things, basically, that they actually eat into an Atlantic rowing boat. Thank you. Who, you. So, we decided for ration packs. Less tasty than the chickens, but they last longer and you can fit them into the boat. So the point of this is when you're going into a new environment, you need to do your best to understand it. You need the right attitude, you need the right tools, and you need the right team around you. Without those, you are increasing your likelihood of failure. Now, how many of you like science fiction? Hey, excellent. Look at this. So, for those of you, basically, that grew up in the 80s, because I grew up in the 2000s, obviously, um, all the, all the programmes that we were watching on TV, you know, they had all these sort of amazing science fiction technologies. You know, all sorts of things. Had aliens. But today, a lot of these science fiction technologies are actually already here and manifesting themselves. So last year, scientists in the US created an E. coli. But these E. coli are very, very different to every single organism that has ever trodden the planet. We all share something in common. We have four DNA bases. These E. coli have six. Now, from a futures perspective, you, I know what you're doing. You're looking at that and you're going, okay, six base DNA, alien life form. So what? If you take a six base DNA life form or sequence and you put it into Microsoft Azure's cloud after 2020, you can use it to store all of the world's information on the size of a pinhead. So when you look at technologies in isolation, you miss the bigger picture, you miss the connections. Last year, basically, we created the world's first artificial black hole. Um, and I met the guys at CERN, basically, and they said, well, actually, fortunately, it wasn't a, uh, a gravitational black hole, uh, which is nice. Um, but what we did there, basically, is we fired lasers at individual molecules. Those molecules imploded, collapsed, and then pulled everything else in around them. Uh, we can 3D print food. <coughs> Kind of a food replicator if you want to go there, Star trek -y type. Uh, and this stuff's getting better and better. We can 3D print meat and all kinds of things now. We're creating hive minds. So when we talk about hive minds at the moment, basically we're starting on the digital side. If you think self-driving cars, if you think robots, basically you connect a bunch of robots into the cloud, you fuel it with artificial intelligence, and you now have robots that teach each other. Hive mind. Uh, but we also did this with rats. So we got two rats basically on different continents, connected them via a biological hive mind, and they taught each other basically how to go around a maze. When we talk about holograms as well, you know, how many of you have seen a real hologram? And I'm not talking about the £1.50 postcards that you get down from WH Smith. A real hologram. I was in, I was in Abu Dhabi over the past couple of days. And uh, this was one of the uh, videos, basically, that Rolls-Royce showed. You know? And uh, again, you know, a lot of innovation teams are going, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to have all these sort of you know, science fiction, you know, minority report interfaces, and you know, they were taking this particular holographic boat in the video, and they're spinning it around, and all that kind of stuff. But holograms, volumetric holograms, basically like the Princess Leia holograms, basically, that you see in Star Wars, are already here. There is no trick to this. This is the world's first 3D living hologram. The finger shows the scale. It's not part of the, it's not part of the demonstration. Who wants to know how you do that? Yeah. Because controlling light is difficult. 
So what we do is we use lasers to trap a piece of nanocellulose. That nanocellulose is then manipulated around. You shine other lasers at it. 3D living hologram. As I say, technology is all the way over here. And technology is fueling change. You get ideas and you combine things together. You get next generation products, services, and next generation industries. Knowledge uploading. We did that a couple of years ago. We took 30 uh, American Top Gun pilots, basically via DARPA, put them into simulators. We took F 35s up to 35,000 feet, put them into a flat spin, recorded the pilots' brainwaves. Uh, the pilots, basically, were then commanded to land those uh, aircraft. And then once they had, we got 30 other volunteers who'd never been in an aircraft before. Put them into the simulator, hooked them up basically to the brain machine interface systems, replayed the, pi the Top Gun pilot's brain waves because the human brain is plastic. You think AI is going to start beating you? We've got a lot up here that we aren't tapping yet. 80% of the volunteers landed these F-35s and the 20% that didn't didn't land the F-35s because they simply didn't have quick enough reaction times. When this first came out, the critics said, yeah, but that effect only, knowledge uploading only lasted 30 minutes. And the scientists went, what the fuck? We just uploaded knowledge. Molecular assemblers. In the 1960s, basically, we were told that molecular assemblers were impossible despite the fact that every single one of you is a molecular assembler. About two months ago now, we created the first uh, molecular-sized robots. We put them into a production line, and they created molecules, molecular assembler. British Aerospace basically are looking to use these types of technologies to grow drones. Technology starts small, but it gets better faster. Neural streaming. If we go back in time, traditional magicians basically would say, I'm going to stand on stage, I'm going to read your minds. Today, basically, I don't need to be a magician reading your mind, because if I have a bunch of sensors in the walls, I can read them from a distance. What you see here, basically, is a combination of something called an fMRI machine, which is something you find in a healthcare facility reading images from people's minds in real time. It's transposed through an AI, a neural network. But this thing can also stream movies from people's heads. Three years ago, this was actually quite grainy, but if I actually asked you what these images were today, you'd sort of see that's a cross. But when you have a look at this and you sort of think, OK, these are a bit gimmicky, what we are doing here is we are reading information from billions of neurons, transposing it through an artificial intelligence to read your mind and visualize what you are thinking about on a television. You could stream this to YouTube. That'd be scary. Telepathy. We hooked two people up, basically, at Harvard about two years ago and they managed to communicate again via brain machine interfaces telepathically. Mark Zuckerberg is now heavily investing in brain machine interface technology to turn Facebook, once he gets out of Congress, um, into the world's first telepathic network. Crazy, but there are people who are developing this. From a telepathic perspective though, they have sort of more benign applications. If you're a, if you're a patient in a hospital and you have a locked in, something called locked in syndrome where you can't communicate with loved ones, these technologies are a godsend because you can talk and communicate and visualize your thoughts, basically, with loved ones. So while we might sort of think, our oh, telepathy, a bit gimmicky, science fiction, hmm, so what? What does that mean to me? What does that mean to an industry? There's lots of different things. Tractor beams. I mean, come on, you know, in, in Star Trek, basically, they were tractor beaming, um, you know, Klingon ships, basically, like crazy. Um, and today, basically, actually, University of Bristol outdid the University of New York in tractor beams. And uh, this device here, if you go onto the web, if, it's a fun project for the weekend, go onto the web, search tractor beams, University of Bristol, uh, you can 3D print your own tractor beam making device. But when we talk about tractor beams, you know, on the one hand, if I came to you and said, I think you should care about tractor beams, you'll go, no, I don't give a monkeys because basically I'm a manufacturer. 
or I'm in something. But this is where you need to make different connections in your brain. This is a tractor beam working. If you take a tractor beam, and it can move all sorts of things, it can move solder around and liquids and all sorts of bits and pieces and green blobs. If you take that tractor beam and you put it into a 3D printer, you now have a 3D printer that can 3D print components and different bits and bobs, move them around, assemble them, in this case basically it uses laser welding, to create electronics. Tractor beam plus 3D printer equals manufacturing revolution. This is the laser. And there's a circuit working. Basic today, next year it's going to be better, the year after it's going to be exponentially better. So when I talk about basically some of the science fiction things that are now becoming reality, and we're having conversations with executives and we say, Look, you know, we think the world's changing, we think it's changing a little bit faster than actually you anticipate. Um, there is a chance, basically, that your industry might actually be disrupted and uh, that your own organisation basically might sort of feel some disruptive pressure or change or whatever you want to call it. You know, the majority of CEOs basically still say, well, there's not a chance. So can you say it with me? If I ask you, what's the chance of being disrupted, what's the answer? Not a chance. See, actually, see, you're not going to graduate from the CEO board of, uh, of, board of management, I'm sorry. Which is good, because actually the guys at the University of Oxford all said, yeah, not a chance. That's it. So they were wrong. So you guys, actually, you're already ahead of the curve. It's good. So the pace of change is accelerating. But what I want to do is, it's all very well, people standing, actually, and saying, pace of change is accelerating. Wouldn't it be nice to know why it's accelerating? Innovation... Every organisation does innovation, but innovation is not disruption. If you want to disrupt, it is innovation plus execution. Now today, on the left hand side, you need a variety of things. There are actually about 50 odd things that you need. It's not a simple task, disrupting an industry, but it is actually easier than you think. On the left hand side, basically you need an organisation basically that has the right culture, the right thinking. About a year ago, someone said to me, they said, Matt, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to change the world. And then, actually, I had to pause at that point because I thought, actually, that's a little bit grand wise, but it's a little bit um, out there, and I don't really, you know, do I really, you know, I doubted what I could do. At the moment, basically, I'm transforming 4G7 nations, energy grids, and all kinds of things. The phones, basically, that you will have in your hands, basically, over the next 20 years, have got my fingerprints all over them. So I think I'm doing a decentish job. You don't need a huge amount of resources to change the thinking within your organisation to create new ideas, new concepts, find new needs and all these sorts of things. But you do need the right attitude. Attitude is everything here. On the right hand side, once you've found basically your, your new need, you need to put it together. And today, basically, when we're putting next generation products together, everything is technology. Yeah? You want to make a glass, it's manufacturing technology with materials. Let's say you want to produce a microphone thing. Uh, everything uses technology throughout its life cycle. So today we have a lot of powerful technologies, and you'll have heard of all of these. Every analyst that you talk to basically will be telling you you've watched these. So you've got the right sort of organisation. On the left hand, on the left hand side, uh, you've got some technologies. You've got your product, but you need to get it into the market because you want to sell it. This is where execution comes in, adoption. It's got to be accessible, it's got to be adopt it's got to be easy to adopt. If you create something like the iPhone, for example, and it's difficult to buy, it's not available in your local area, you're not going to buy it. If it's difficult to adopt, when you unpack it, they say, well, here's a, here's a manual, it's 300 pages, you know, you have to code it yourself and everybody else, you're not going to buy it. Design matters. Cultural bias. Depending on the generation that you sit in, you know, we talk about millennials. We were having a conversation about millennials last night. Uh, millennials, basically, are, are famed, allegedly, 
for understanding the new mobile digital world, social networks, all that kind of stuff. Yeah? From a cultural biospace, my kids are already using artificial intelligence and behavioral computing. And they're three and six. Huge gap. Geopolitics. If you're an organization based out of China and you want to sell into the US, well, geopolitics might actually play a role. Network effects. And then regulators. So we've created our next generation product. You put it in front of the regulators and the regulators go, say for example we take autonomous energy grids as I did with Ofgem recently, you stick it in front of the regulators, basically the regulators go, what the hell is that? Tell you what, give us about seven, you know, three to seven years, basically turn on, you know, give us three to seven years and we'll try and figure this out. Uh, and once we've figured it out, basically we'll then say yes or no to whether or not you can get that thing into the marketplace. Some of the things that we are doing basically is we are working with the regulators basically to help them get way ahead of the curve. So, for example, you know, one of the conversations I had with Ofgem is I said, okay, from an energy perspective, do you have a point of view on artificial intelligence and its impact on the energy grid? And they sort of went, hmm, yeah, sort of. What about blockchain? And they sort of went, eh, less so. Okay, what about quantum computing? And they went, mm, no. And I said, okay. Uh, what about all three of them together? Because they're all coming together now. I said, no. I said, who would you go and ask? If you wanted just a point of view, basically, on the impact that these different technologies would actually have on your business or your particular industry, who would you ask? And I said, I haven't got anyone. So we're educating regulators, basically, around the world. But the same thing applies to organizations. If you wanted to understand the impact of different technologies, you know, or the impact that different technologies could or will have basically on your industry or, all, you, or your organization, who are you going to go to? You can talk about AI, you can talk about technologies in silo, but this clicker isn't a piece of silo technology. It uses a laser basically with plastics and all sorts of bits and pieces, and that's just this, let alone anything more complicated. Now, today, basically, we all hear about exponential technologies. And this is a slide you should probably expect someone like me to put up. But when we talk about exponential technologies, what a lot of people sort of forget is that their power increases exponentially at the same time as their costs are falling exponentially. When you have a look particularly at digital technologies, let's say, for example, artificial intelligence, once you take AI and you shove it into the cloud, you democratize it. Technology today does have a democratizing effect. So if I'm Google, I put one of the world's most advanced artificial intelligences basically into the cloud, I give it away for free. Three and a half billion people today with an internet connection can go and download it. They can then go and watch YouTube videos and they can go and create something using artificial intelligence. They can then use that technology to try to change an industry, build a business, tear down an industry, whatever it happens to be. All of a sudden, basically, the amount of competition that you have is exploding. Five years ago, you would have 10 million new company registrations around the world. Last year, there were 100 million. The cost of building, operating, and scaling a business has fallen through the floor. It's a little bit of an exorbitant statement, but it depends on the industry you're in. Some industries, basically, the costs have dropped by a thousandfold, and they're going to go down. Now, the interesting thing is, if you have a look along the top, that's the disruption cycle. If you step back about 100 years ago, uh, it would take about 90 years to disrupt an industry. Now, roughly, basically, in sort of 2018, we're roughly at the kind of seven to eight mark. And, you know, if you have a look at the evidence around you, if I went back just to 2010 and I said, and I sat down with the CEOs of all the major auto manufacturers and I said, I think in 2018, basically, you're going to repurpose billions of dollars of R&D into electric vehicles and cars that drive themselves, where do you think I would be? I'd be shoved in a closet or something like that. And yet now, eight years later, the entire transportation industry is changing. Sometimes things sound mad, but sometimes they actually aren't. Now, increasingly, 
we are getting the rest of the planet connected. At the moment, around 50% of the planet's connected. The other 50%, people who live in the Andes, the mountains, you know, the countryside like me, um, don't really have access to decent broadband or any type of internet connectivity. So if the pace of change is accelerating because there are more entrepreneurs basically doing more things than ever before, and we're about to double the number of people basically who have internet connectivity and who have access to those democratizing digital technologies, how safe do you think your businesses and your uh, organizations are? And this is one of the biggest challenges, basically, that organizations face today. If I asked you if you had a point of view, basically, on cloud, big data, artificial intelligence, blockchain, I think the majority of you, basically, would actually say, yes, we have a good point of view. But these technologies are all backing up. They're all coming at the same time. They're coming faster than ever before. In this example, if, you know, if I went back in time, basically, about 20 years ago, and I said, OK, do you have a point of view on the future of computing? You'd have looked at Moore's Law, you'd have looked at silicon CPUs, basically, and you'd have gone, yeah, I think uh, in 18 months' time they'll be twice as powerful and half the cost. And I go, well, what could you do with that as a business? And you go, well, yeah, we could analyze more information, process more information, do more transactions, whatever it happened to be. It was a bit easier to see this stuff. But now these technologies are backing up. And that's creating a problem. This is why organizations and industries and governments basically are being increasingly sideswiped because the pace and rate of change basically is crazy. And it's getting faster. And I think it's crazy. And I track this stuff. And it's only getting more complex. And it's only getting more interconnected. But you know, when you go and have a conversation basically with the likes of IDC, Gartner, Forrester, 451, whoever you're having a conversation with, basically, and you say, We'd like to have a point of view, basically, on some of the interesting emerging technologies that we think will actually have a meaningful difference, basically, to our organization and our industry, basically, whether it's threats or opportunities. They will show you, basically, what I showed you on that triangle. Have a conversation about AI, blockchain, robotics, VR, AR. Have you tried AR in the customer experience? Should do. What they don't know about, what they won't tell you, is this. Not dinosaurs. Is my clicker's broken? Um, there aren't just five or ten game-changing emerging technologies here today. This radar represents 180 game-changing emerging technologies. Each one of these dots represents a technology with an with an addressable market opportunity of around half a trillion dollars. And there are another hundred that I couldn't fit onto the chart. So we'll sort of walk through a couple. But if you start putting these technologies together in different combinations, that's your next generation product or service. That's your next generation phone. It's your next generation healthcare. So we've got 5G coming through at the moment, but we will eventually have 6G. Um, we've got things like multi-fire and nano-satellites basically going up. We also have things like nil communication. If you sit in the defense sector, I can send information to you without sending information. It's a quantum effect. And it's been demonstrated. That's kind of a crazy one. Um, on the energy side of things, basically we have things like artificial photosynthesis, basically we have electronic blood. What happens basically, if I can get rid of the battery basically, and just replace it with liquid? It's a sort of standard redox reaction. Um, we have fusion. But now, based on the back of fusion, basically, we have quark energy. Quark energy is about eight times as powerful as fusion. Uh, we have things like backscatter energy systems. So backscatter energy systems uh, harvest energy from the air. And we've actually created prototype smartphones that don't have batteries. But if you think about backscatter uh, energy systems, an application here is you can put backscatter and backscatter energy system into an IoT device. Now that IoT device or sensor doesn't need a battery. You can put it in a field, you can put it in all sorts of different places. We've got all sorts of different machine systems basically coming through. Um, and again, basically these are going to fuel the future of computing. 
We have DNA computers, chemical computers, which we'll sort of talk about in a little bit, liquid computers, machine vision. If you take machine vision, combine it with artificial intelligence, combine it with a robot, my God. You have a self-driving car, basically you change basically factory dynamics basically overnight. That's three techs. We have things like nanotubes. Basically, if you, who cares about nanotubes? Yeah. If you were paralyzed, you would care about nanotubes. Because we can use nanotubes to bridge the spine. And we've done it, and we've reversed paralysis. Do you care about nanotubes? It's a point of view. Polymers. Who cares about polymers? No one. No one cares about these things. If you're an electric vehicle manufacturer, basically, and you use a polymer again from the University of Bristol, you can charge your electric car on a 500 mile range, basically, in three seconds. Do you now care about polymers? If you are Henkel, the German conglomerate, basically, and you produce Purcell, and I come to you and I say, I have a new polymer. You put it in your machine and uh, it lasts 10,000 cycles uh, and it doesn't produce polluting water and everything else, all of a sudden, personal manufacturers, because I speak to them, care about polymers. You could disrupt everything. Uh, quantum materials, who cares about quantum materials? No? No. But if you take a quantum material, you shove it into a quantum sensor, you can now eliminate the global GPS system. And China and the US are doing that. When you look at technologies as just for what they are, it's unlikely you care about very many of them at all. But when you start looking at what they can do, they can change everything. You can change a GPS industry overnight, basically, to get quantum sensors out into the marketplace. On the security side of things, we have artificial immune systems. Basically, we have things like Morpheus computing platforms. So the Morpheus computing platform is a hardware and software self-configuring, self-reconfiguring computer platform that seems to be unhackable. If we have a look at things like hack-proof code, basically it's kind of a mathematical algorithm. Basically we put hack-proof code basically into a helicopter over in the US and we got 20 of the world's best hackers to try and crack it. And we said, take control of the helicopter, fly it, do whatever you want with the helicopter. Two weeks later, they hadn't hacked it. They had physical access to the helicopter and wireless access to the helicopter. And then, of course, we have things like user experiences because, again, basically from a, a customer perspective, I don't care if you're using artificial intelligence or nano wires or whatever it happens to be. I just care how I use it. When you start taking all of these different technologies and you combine them together, you create new industry economics. This is, what is the, this is what's going to actually hurt you. And an example of this, using a single technology, is artificial intelligence. Um, so if you came here today, basically you came up in, say for example, you came up in a lift, you are trusting today basically that the software stops the lift at the right floor and it doesn't plunge you into the basement. Tomorrow when you get into your car, the car basically will start making the decisions for you. So we're starting to give more trust and more decision making to the machines and you're going to trust that that self-driving car presses its own brake pedal. However, increasingly, as machines get increasingly creative and capable and all that sort of stuff, the, entre the, the businesses that you are going to face in the future might not have been created by a human. Like this one. Last year, there was a company called Ada. Um, it manages around half a billion dollars worth of hedge fund money. Um, it is a fully autonomous organization. And it's not the only one. There are more coming. What I mean by a fully autonomous organization is I mean an organization that runs, operates, and scales without any people involved. No human input. So everything I'm talking about here basically, is kind of the, sort of the, the tip of the, snow, you know, the snowflake on the tip of the iceberg. So when we talk about disruption and change, yeah, it's changed. It's getting faster, you feel it getting faster, and it's only going to get faster from here on in. However, how many of you here would like to double your rate of innovation? 
Yeah? Times it by five. Times it by a hundred. Times it by a thousand. No one wants to increase their rate of innovation but a thousand fold. We now have these coming through. This is a generative AI. It's, it does iterative innovation, particularly on hardware. And from those options, pick the one design that delivers on the most important criteria, the design you couldn't possibly have imagined. This is generative design, a technology that harnesses massive computing power, creating forms with precise amounts of material only where needed, achieving maximum performance while wasting nothing. The generative design can be about much more than simply turning out alternatives. Prototypes can be scanned and equipped with sensors that provide real-time performance data that can be looped back into the design process so the object, in effect, co-designs itself. And depending on the material and method of manufacture chosen, the software can optimize the design for those choices. The things that have limited us in the past, software, materials, manufacturing, no longer do so. With generative design, the world can look and perform any way we want it to. This is the next stage in the evolution of design, and it's happening now. So what you do is you strap sensors into a product. Basically, you take the data from that product, you feed it into a generative AI. Basically, that AI runs simulations. You tell the AI basically what you want that simulation to do. Create a lighter, faster, more reliable drone, in that example. The AI goes off, it crunches tens of thousands of simulations, basically a second, and it comes out with a design. You start doing that basically with military hardware, you start doing that with phones, basically you start doing that basically with chairs, you start doing that basically with clothing. And all of a sudden, as you'll see in a bit, the rate of innovation for one company using that basically dropped from 18 months down to three days. So today basically these sort of generative AIs basically are literally here. So they're okay at taking a hardware-based product, pulling some more information in, some data sets, basically, and then iterating it. Over time, basically, they get more intuitive. Say, for example, basically, you now have an AI that's strapped into Facebook or Twitter. Basically, it reads Twitter sentiments. It's easily done today. And it says, lots of people basically have been complaining about this particular product. So what I've done is I've taken a digital version of that particular product uh, and I've now iterated it in line with, with the, uh, the complaints basically that I've heard. Here's your new product. What would you like me to do with it? You can do this today. It's a, it's a question of integrating stuff together. Now, where we start getting a little bit more interesting basically, is computing power basically is increasing a lot. AI is improving a lot. And then we have new materials and 3D printing. Now, when you take those different emerging technologies and you combine them all together, Right, you get this weird looking thing. So this again is a world first. It's from the University of Oslo and it's literally kind of a sausage robot. Um, what this robot does is it was tasked with getting from one side of the room to the other as quickly as possible. It has sensors built into it. Those sensors feed information back into this AI. This AI is running simulations and models to try to sort of figure out what's the fastest way and what's the best design to get this robot from one side of the stage to the other side of the stage, for example, in the fastest time. And it comes up with a new design. That's the AI here. The AI basically comes up with a new design, basically, and then it sends that to a 3D printer. So the cost of creating prototypes has just dropped through the floor. A highly paid lab technician uh, takes the plastic bits and assembles them together and then he puts the robot back on the floor. However, if you replace that 3D printer with a 4D printer, as we did actually a couple of years ago with MIT, you now have a robot that can print off in a 4D printer and walk out of the printer. Now imagine what that starts doing basically with some of the robotics companies out there. And while again, all of these look slightly gimmicky, 
The message is this stuff is getting faster. This stuff looks weird, but today it is developing robots. And tomorrow we are going to use it to change something else. So what happens basically with that AI basically is a material scientist. We have these coming out of MIT. You want to create a brand new material for something, AI is on the journey. What if it's a chemist? Organic chemistry uh, with things like IBM Watson and a couple of other sort of technologies that are out there as well. If you're a chemical company, does that speed up your rate of innovation? Does that mean you get your products out to market faster? Does that mean that your competition go, wow, where did that product come from? It normally takes them three years to produce a new chemical. What happens if it's a synthetic biologist? Google DeepMind basically is now doing this kind of stuff. So how many of you would like to disrupt an industry right here, right now? Okay. So what I thought we might like to do, this is, a, this is an industry that has already gone through a lot of pain. And if you go and speak to this particular industry, they think they've already been disrupted. Retail. You think retailers basically have felt the pain, basically that they have yeah, felt all the pain? What we do is we take different technologies that look fairly lowbrow when you put them in isolation. When you combine them, you change global retail. So what we do is we take the creative AI now. The creative AI goes out to, say, Snapchat, uh, Facebook, and everything else, basically, and looks at popular designs. So say, for example, you want a jacket. It goes off, it goes and has a look at jackets, basically, that are the highest rated. Simple thing. You can build these AIs today. It then iterates it. So it takes, a, say, a black jacket, and it just puts some detailing on it, but it iterates it. It then puts that jacket basically onto Amazon's web page. You go onto Amazon, you were looking for a black jacket basically with a red lapel. Um, you click it, you think, oh, I quite like that. Um, Amazon bought a company called Body, Body Labs. So you now stand in front of the Echo Show, basically it takes a body scan of you and just digitizes it. Yeah. You now, it now shows you, using high resolution rendering and all these kinds of things that let the material flow, it shows you what you look like, basically, in that garment. Whether it's a virtual mirror, whether it's the television, whether it's your phone, whatever it happens to be. So now you see yourself, basically, in that piece of clothing. You decide you want to buy it. So patent number 9,782,906 will bring retailers a lot of pain. That jacket never existed until you bought it. When you click buy, this patent draws the fabric down that it needs makes you that jacket on demand. Amazon now have no inventory. Their cost of operation has just sunk through the floor. And meanwhile, clothing retailers are going, how are Amazon selling these high quality clothes basically at such a low price? And how come their profit margins have just done that? Then, once the jacket's been made, it can be fulfilled and can be sent to you autonomously. Robots, drones, all that kind of stuff, all here today. Today, basically, from a fulfillment perspective, it takes 30 seconds, basically, of manual labor to pick your jacket and put it into the right bin. Thanks to artificial intelligence, machine vision, and robotics, we no longer, longer need those warehouse pickers. And it arrives, but at the moment, this applies to fabrics. You can design duvets, curtains, rugs, throws, all sorts of stuff. So, Retailers, like Debenhams, who are holding all this sort of stuff in stock, they're about to compete with a completely new beast. And I reckon, now that Amazon has assembled these pieces, I reckon you might see the first prototype, of the, the uh, prototype run of this tech coming in about 2019. Because they've got the technology, they put it together, they integrate it, they put the processes together, and then they test it. And as it gets better, it'll go down. You know, today, basically, it might be very good at producing you know, 10 million white T-shirts, but tomorrow, basically, it's going to produce details. It's going to start taking on the boutiques. But retail isn't the only one, but the only one feeling pain. If we have a look at the agricultural sector, so I was out in the UAE. The UAE, UAE is basically a desert. You know, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Sharjah, it's a desert. What we are doing in the UAE, basically, is we are bringing farming, basically, to the UAE. 
We're turning them from importing 100% of their food to becoming a net exporter using technology. So today, basically, they buy a lot of products, basically from Unilever, P&G, you know, Kraft, all these kinds of guys. 30 million customers are about to turn off. So vertical farms, this picture sort of goes. The cow, China just bought $300 million basically, worth of clean meat. You take stem cells from a Wagyu beef cow, put it into a bioreactor, you can grow prime fillet. You can grow duck. You can grow turkey, beef, all kinds of stuff. You can produce meat without the animal. And then we have precision agriculture, basically, which changes the economics of farming. Now, I live in farming communities. It used to be the case you used to have to use loads of fertilizers and pesticides and everything else, even in traditional farms. Using precision agriculture, you can cut down the number of chemicals that you need to use by about 90%. You know, one of the farmers around by us just spent 30,000 pounds on chemicals. He does, he's not going to have to do that. He might end up spending 500 quid. Changing the economics of an industry. If you take a vertical farm, you put solar panels on the roof, you now have cheap, free energy. Technology in combination. When we have a look at the aviation sector, increasingly, if you take the pilot out, and Boeing and uh, Airbus are doing this, first prototype comes this year, but they reckon that by 2030 they'll actually have pilotless planes, regional pilotless planes. You take a pilot out, that's 30% of the operating cost. Uh, that's 10%, actually. Uh, if you use some of the battery technologies that are now coming through, uh, you save 30% of your operating cost. If you now have autonomous cargo handlers basically on the ground, you save another 10%. Uh, if you use blockchain, AI, and a whole variety of different automation technologies, uh, you can cut out, say, another, let's be really, let's lowball it, let's say 10%. I've had these conversations basically with companies like Airbus and Bombardier and everything else. We have the technology today to strip at least 50% out of the cost of operating aircraft. And that's before we start 3D printing them. Lawyers, how many of you like lawyers? <laughs> oh, look, that was a laugh. Yeah? We have autonomous lawyers coming through. So Denton's basically recently used an artificial intelligence called Ross to replace their entire paralegal there. As an organization, how many of your organizations, particularly if you're sort of selling stuff, how many of your sales guys have gone, hey, look, I've got a deal. Basically, you know, this customer basically wants, uh, wants to buy something from me. Um, yeah. You, and he says, but, you know, he's got, he's got a bit of a question about the contract. And you send that contract basically through to your contracts team. And your contracts team go, you know what, there are only five of us and really, we're really resource constrained. We'll get back to you in about two months' time. These operate in real time. We put these autonomous lawyers basically up against Harvard, Stanford, and the University of Columbia lawyers. Uh, on things like NDAs and everything else. There's a number of different platforms. And um, the human lawyers basically found about 80% of the mistakes. The robo-lawyers found 82%. And you sort of think, hmm, okay, sort of similar. So robo-lawyer still beats human lawyer in that particular case. Um, but the human lawyers took two weeks. The AI took two minutes. JP Morgan are using this technology and they've reduced basically the amount of legal time by 370,000 hours. Global internet coverage. Basically, if you are a Vodafone, and I sat with Vodafone and sort of T-Mobile and all these other guys basically a couple of years ago and they said, what's going to disrupt us? Nothing's going to disrupt us. You shove 12,000 satellites into low Earth orbit with the likes of SpaceX, Virgin, uh, Qualcomm and a variety of other organizations, the FCC have granted the licenses on these as well, so we talk about the regulators. You can now beam internet coverage to every single square centimeter on Earth. You certainly start hurting the traditional communications providers. And these satellites, basically, that used to cost about 20 million apiece, actually, they now cost about $1,000 a launch and a piece. Cost of technology is dropping through the floor. Smarter homes, connected washing machines. This washing machine, when it runs out of powder, can go onto the hop onto the blockchain, basically, and go and form a consortium. And it can say, I've run out of washing powder, uh, but three million other washing machines have run out of powder as well. Forms a buying consortium. It goes out, basically, to an e-bid and uh, says, I want the best personal. I want the best price on three million packets. Sometimes some of the changes and some of the ways that you can disrupt industries, basically, aren't actually that obvious. 
Any money that it saves, it can put it into a Samsung bank account. Autonomous warfare. That's freaky. Um, it used to, you know, if you go back to World War II, a 600 foot destroyer basically used to need about 1,500 people. The US recently released the US Zoom Vault, which is a $4 billion destroyer, has 114 people on it. Um, and it can, you know, it, well, they can go fully autonomous, let alone these. Uh, these MQ 9 Reaper drones basically are now fully autonomous out of Jacksonville with the USAF and the US Marines. Um, we have fully autonomous warships already here. We have things called the Sea Hunter, basically, so fully autonomous mine hunters. Yeah. Hypersonics. You combine, a hy you combine hypersonics and artificial intelligence with a cruise missile, you get something that's very unfriendly, let alone basically when we start looking at drones. When we have a look at the energy sector, over the past 10 years, $2.9 trillion, trillion dollars of investment has flown into renewables. You've got the Norwegian pension fund that's moving out of fossil fuels. But when we start having a look at the energy sector, these things basically, you know, we, it's, these things basically need a whole variety of different technologies to work. They need grid scale storage. They need battery systems. Um, when we look at solar, solar basically at the moment, solar panels are about 27% efficient. We can see a path using something like Perskovite, which you can 3D print, to get 35%. Solar is now the cheapest form of electricity in 70 different countries. So all of a sudden, basically, we're now looking at things like blockchain microgrids, autonomous energy grids. Uh, we are looking at grid-tied storage. You know, what impact does this have on the rest of the network? If you're a manufacturer and I can come to you and I can say, I can reduce your cost of energy by half, and this is how we do it, it changes the economics of your business. Bankers. We've already got the world's first fully autonomous organisation in the financial services sector, but you know, robo wealth advisors. Um, yeah, you've got Goldman Sachs, basically that are trying to automate IPOs, basically like crazy and everything else. A lot of automation there. Estonia. The way that we need to think about sovereign governments and borders and everything else. If you want to go and live in, if you want to go and live in a different country, you have to get a visa. You've got to cross a border. In today's digital world, some of the conversations that we're actually having are, why do you need borders? So we're now starting to create what we call e-citizen ships. So if you want to be a citizen of another country and actually get some of the benefits of that other country and contribute or whatever it happens to be, you can do that. So suddenly we're starting to rethink the sovereign state. When we look at healthcare, healthcare is a crazy space as well. So we have AIs, basically, that are better at diagnosing lung disease, basically, than trained radiologists. We also have AIs, basically, that are now best getting better at doctors than predicting the lifespan of people with heart attacks, um, or even just general life. So, for example, if you have a, a 3D body scan, CAT scan, MRI, ultrasound, X-ray, you put all that together, you, get an, you put an artificial intelligence from Australia onto that, it will look, basically, at all the different things that it thinks are wrong with your body, compare that, basically, with its big databases and information, and it will say, people like you who have these types of conditions typically live this long, let alone, basically, recommending treatments and all that kind of stuff. But again, this is at the start. You know, if I take a mobile phone, how many of you in this room uh, would like to figure out, basically, if you have the deadly heart condition arrhythmia? You've got to go to a doctor today to do that, haven't you? or pancreatic cancer. Take your smartphone, put it on your chest, download an app basically from a fin, fin company, and it will tell you basically whether you have arrhythmia, because it's using micro movements and sound. You're democratizing healthcare. If I look like I'm taking a selfie, another application basically will detect the yellowness in your eyes and your skin tone, and it will determine whether or not you have pan pancreatic cancer. It can then phone up the doctor for you. These technologies can be used in some amazing ways, and we are just tipping, we're just on the, uh, the tip of the iceberg. In vivo gene editing, if you were born two weeks ago with an inherited genetic disease like Huntingdon syndrome or Hunter syndrome, and you go to a doctor and say, oh, what are my chances? You know, what's my life going to be? I have Hunter syndrome. What's my life going to be? The doctor will sit you down and say, bad news. Don't think you're going to live very long, and I think the life you're going to have is very painful. 
using CRISPR-like technologies and other gene editing technologies, actually in the UK NHS, about two months ago, we used a new serum to go in and genetically edit out some of these faulty inherited genes by seeing a Hunter's patient or a Hunter's syndrome patient who no longer has the disease. In vivo gene editing. Some of this is, you know, this is science fiction, but it's here. The UK NHS is doing this. The NHS, they've all moans about. If you, take, if you take some of these body scans, we can now create a baseline for you. So if you think about the NHS, you go into the NHS and they say, what we want to do is we want to put you into that CAT scanner, ultrasound, MRI, X-ray machine and everything else. And you go, why? And they go, well, what we want is we want a digital copy of you. And you go, well, why? And they go, well, because in the future, if something's wrong with you, we're going to have all the information that we need from you at a cellular level. And we take your stem cells. And in the future, basically, if your pancreas starts failing or your liver starts failing, we'll just print you out a new one that's yours, it's personalised. And you can do a lot more besides. Next generation healthcare. 3D organ printing, we've been able to print parts of 3D, uh, 3D print parts of brains, human heart tissue, artificial skin, well, human skin, actually, because it's stem cells, bones, cartilage, kidneys. We've created artificial blood. Again, the UK NHS is doing some good things in this space. Stem cells. How many of you got teeth? <laughs> See, that's three. Three of you got teeth. That's great. <laughs> so, University of Nottingham. You know, when we talk about things, when we talk about innovation, the UK actually has quite a lot of innovation. We should give ourselves some credit, but there's a lot more that we can be doing. Um, today, if you have a cavity, basically you go into the dentist, and the dentist goes, oh, you've got a cavity, I'm going to give you an amalgam filling, Right? Uh, you have the amalgam fin filling, you pay your money, but in about 10 to 20 years later, that amalgam filling cracks, and you go back in, right? Using something like a metamaterial, basically from the University of Nottingham, and there are a variety of different ways we can do this, that amalgam filling is now a metamaterial. The dentist puts it into your tooth, and this has been proven already, it's going through the regulators now. Um, that metamaterial interfaces with the stem cells in your pulp tissue, regrows your tooth. Okay? So from an individual perspective, you have your own teeth back. However, if your den plan, and I say, I think you, what you really want to do today, basically, is you want to grow market share like absolute stink, because in seven years' time, this technology will be on the market, but then it's got to commercialise. It's going to commercialise in about 10 to 12 years' time, and, and, and. If den plan basically suddenly have 90% market share, they go, I'll tell you what, yeah, we'll go in, you can go into the dentist, but rather than having an amalgam filling, you can have one of our special metamaterial fillings. All of a sudden, they haven't got to pay back out, basically, for your cracked crown or whatever it happens to be. All of a sudden, their profit margins increase. All of a sudden, basically, Den Plan's com competition basically wonder why they're profitable. How come we didn't see that coming? When we look at robotics as well, last year, basically, we trialled a neurosurgeon robot, basically, that operated 50 times faster than the world's best neurosurgeon. And while we talk about robotics, we have nanobots. If you want to understand basically whether or not you have cancer, but the early stages of cancer, we can use nanoparticles and we can use nanobots. You put nanobots basically into your bloodstream, they can pick up particular DNA markers, uh, something called CT3A, and they can figure out that you've got cancer because that's a cancerous gene. However, if it's in your bloodstream, you can spot the very start of that cancerous growth one to two years before it becomes a real problem. Life extension. Regenerative medicine. You want to grow back a body part? Basically, we've already regrown stomachs and all sorts of stuff. So, healthcare basically is a crazy space. Um, if you're in the insurance sector, everything's getting connected. Cyber risk is everywhere. You know, we now have artificial intelligences that are now starting to try to attack your organizations. Used to be a human hacker that might try to attack your organization. Now it's a robo hacker. How do you compete against that? Um, so from, a, yeah, from an insurance perspective, there's risk everywhere. Electric vehicles, you know what, no drivers, oh, we'll insure that, but how do we do it? Logistics sector. Over in China, basically, we've got the first fully autonomous ports. We have drones and drone ships. You think it's just self-driving cars and self-driving trucks, basically, that are coming along? 
Rolls-Royce and a couple of others are building 500,000 tonne autonomous cargo ships. And if you do that, basically you save 30% of the operating cost of a cargo ship. And then they're also going electric. So the first electric cargo ship was, actually came out of China last year. That saves a lot of money. We're three, uh, in 2021 out in Dubai, basically we're going to 3D print a 80-storey skyscraper. We're also creating fully autonomous construction sites using drones, basically GIS mapping, basically artificial intelligence and fully autonomous equipment. Uh, in Dubai, basically, we're going to be 3D printing 25% of houses by 2030. We're doing it today. This. What's special about these sneakers? These sneakers were designed by the artificial intelligence I showed you earlier. This is the company, Under Armour. These would normally take 18 months to design. It took three days. But these were designed by an AI, and then they 3D print them in the back. Under Armour no longer needs stock or inventory. What happens if you are the manufacturing company for Under Armour? What happens if you're the cargo or the, logis the logistics company that is shipping 100 million sneakers around the world for them? Impacts your business. We have back-flipping robots. Robots are getting better. In addition to that, drones. Drones are everywhere now. Yeah. They're maintaining street lights up in Birmingham, basically, and they are looking at undersea cables. We're building undersea drone highways. And if you go out to, again to Dubai, you can get in an e-hang or a volocopter, which is essentially is a sky taxi. You know, flying cars are dead. Um, and you can see these. We have DNA robots. Don't just think robots are big, but DNA robots, basically, if you're looking at drug discovery, that's a great place to be. Artificial intelligence, basically within the space of about four years, it's now coding itself, self-learning, self-evolving, and self-replicating. And it's doing more than that. If I was standing here about a year ago and talking to you, for example, about bots, we'd be talking about text-based bots. This is an artificial person, customer service clerk. Does that look like a person? Got paws in her face and everything. She is called Ava. She's a neural network. She's being used by NatWest. If you're a NatWest, NatWest account holder, go and speak to her. We've gone from text-based bots to this. She's quite advanced, but she's only just getting started. In addition to that, we have this kind of stuff. So we have AIs, basically, that are creating high-resolution images of individuals in a very short space of time. This doesn't look like much. But how many of you are in marketing? Yeah. Um, if I asked you to put together an advert today, you'd have to go and find a team and everything else. Using these, this is sort of stay, this is like generation 0.1. And by the end of this year, these will be bigger, they'll be better. I can now type what I want to create. So, uh, Create, you know, create a 30-second movie of a surfer. Create a 30-second movie of a golfer. Um, create a movie that, you know, create an advert basically that targets Coke. Hmm. So we're getting to the point of codeless AIs, where you can now start using AIs, even if you aren't a programmer, you can start using and leveraging the power of artificial intelligence without having to be a programmer. We have chemical computers. The first chemical computer was, uh, was started last year, sent a text message. But if you can create a chemical computer, you can turn a person into a computer. DNA computing. If we have a look at things like quantum computers, DNA computing, the University of Manchester created the first architectural blueprint for a DNA computer last year, and it makes quantum computers, which are supposed to be 100 million times faster than traditional computers, look like a rock. If you're in the financial services industry, you need to process a billion transactions. These DNA computers replicate up, do the transactions, calculate it, process it, and then destroy themselves. And DNA storage will be available in Microsoft Azure's cloud in 2020 if you want to use it on a small scale. We have liquid computers. We created liquid transistors. What happens if you turn a glass of water into a computer? What happens basically, if you start putting this technology into the world's oceans? This is where you can go crazy. Do you now start turning the planet's oceans into a planetary supercomputer? 
quantum computing. As soon as the focus and the investment basically goes into trying to build something, quantum computers basically are now, oh, they're already here with D-Wave, but that's not a real one, allegedly. In 2020, uh, IBM basically will push out the first quantum computer as a service. And it will have a few hundred qubits. These change drug discovery, energy discovery. These change artificial intelligence. If you combine AI with a quantum computer, so you create something called a quantum algorithm, you get something very, very crazy. If you're looking at artificial intelligence today, how many of you are looking to 2025 and the advent of quantum artificial intelligence? Because it's already here. It's already been demonstrated. We have micromotes. Basically, you know, these things basically are actually one, milli one millimeter square by one millimeter square. Um, the previous record, record holder, um, which set the record last July, was double the size. Well, it was actually four times the size. Computers are getting smaller. But again, last year, basically, a university out of the US created the first architecture for a virus sized computer. You think silicon is dead? Silicon is kind of dead. But we are now in the Jurassic era, basically, of computing. There's plenty of new types of computing platforms coming through. And when we have a look at the transportation sector, goodbye operators. That changes the dynamics, basically, of industry. In addition to that, cars are going electric. So 3.2 billion people on the planet, as of about 2030 or 2040, will not legally be able to buy a combustion engine car. What does that do for battery investment? Battery investment increases at a phenomenal rate, and that has a knock-on effect into the energy industries, the aircraft industries, your industries, and so on and so on and so on. But what about this? How many of you got a car? Yeah. Did you know it's dying? But you didn't think I'd say that today. When self-driving cars come, if I take away your dashboard, if I take away your pedals, and I take away your steering wheel, and you now essentially get into just a cabin or a pod, is that a car? Because according to Toyota and Audi, they don't think so. Audi and Toyota are now preparing themselves for a future without cars. Audi has something called the Long Distance Lounge, uh, and Toyota basically has something called the e-concept. All of a sudden, take away the things that make a car a car, and you are free to innovate. You can create new form factors and all that kind of stuff. But in addition to that, we have things like the Hyperloop trains. These are essentially trains in a vacuum pod. Uh, they travel at 700 miles an hour. Uh, in the UK, basically, we're sort of quite ahead of the curve. We've got HS2 coming, so we've spent 16 odd billion pounds uh, building a train that does about 150 miles an hour in a track. Elsewhere around the world, I said they're building these. In Dubai, we're going to have the world's first Hyperloop network. Um, to get from Abu Dhabi, to put it into perspective, to get from Abu Dhabi basically down to Dubai in about 30 years ago, took eight hours. Today, it takes two hours. With a Hyperloop in 2021, 2022, it'll take 12 minutes. Suddenly, that changes commute. If you are hiring in Dubai, you can now go and hire people out of Abu Dhabi because you can shove them on a Hyperloop and you can get them into Dubai in, say, 15 minutes. And you can tie these things into fully autonomous transportation networks, so multimodal transportation changes. But in addition to that, if we're going to try and really put some more pain, say, for example, onto the aviation sector, you know, how many of you, when you were children, basically, did your parents basically say, you know, ask your parents basically, you said, in the future, What's transportation look like in the future? And the parents said, well, you know, as you're looping your cars around and playing with rockets. And they said, well, you know, in the future, I think you'll be able to travel uh, on rockets and you can go to the moon and there'll be flying cars. Well, today, basically, we have flying cars. They're actually flying passenger drones, basically, they look like helicopters without a person, without, a, without an operator. But when we start talking about rockets, that reality is starting to come through. But again, the cost of building these things basically has dropped, in this case, a hundredfold. These things have already been tested 50 times successfully. And frankly, you've probably already seen them. Because the future of transportation, as of kind of 2024, will start looking a little bit something like this.
So if you have the vision, we have the technology to help you build your next generation products, services and next generation industries. And we are only just at the beginning. So I'd like to thank you for your time. I hope that's been interesting. And uh, I hope you have a good rest of conference.